Kelly Rush Wagner, thank you so much for being here with us today. We appreciate your time and having you on the program once again. Oh, it's my treat, Laura. I love to be interviewed by you and to work with you. You have the best questions. Oh, well, th thank you. And uh, we love your South Dakota connections as well as everything that you're doing in the world and the insight. And now through this program to the South Dakota Humanities Council, which is part of a Mellon Foundation and Humanities Councils from states all across America. This uh, Why It Matters initiative is you know, where we're starting our conversation today. Um, when we talk about democracy, we're actually starting oh, like a thousand years ago or so <laughs> with the Haudenosaunee women, which is not uh, where most people start that story. Tell us a little bit for people who are new to this story, why these women, um, why this community, this culture was um, relevant to a conversation about civic participation and, and political authority and influence in 2020. Well, I'm speaking to you from Haudenosaunee territory. And these are the five later six nations that joined together and created a peace confederacy a thousand years ago on the shores of Onondaga Lake, um, outside of Syracuse, where I live. And the women have the responsibility and have had this for a thousand years of nominating holding in position and removing, if it becomes necessary, the chiefs that they install to represent their clan. So these are women who have had political voice for a thousand years, while in the United States, we're celebrating women having a political voice guaranteed in the conversation for only a hundred years. So I look at that and I think, hmm, let's see. If somebody has a thousand years of experience and I have a hundred, what is the most logical thing that I should do? <laughs> <laughs> and you maybe, have, listen, maybe listen, maybe listen. <laughs> How do you do this for a thousand years? And the yeah. oldest continuing, arguably, the oldest continuing democracy in the world. So it was a model for the US you know, they had the vision of this from Western history you know, the founding fathers and mothers, we might add, but the fathers, of course, taking the power to make the decisions. Um, but they had this idea from, you know, there was partial democracy in Greece and partial democracy in Rome, but they saw actual democracy in practice with the Haudenosaunee. Now, is this true of all native women? Well, ask the Lakota, how traditional is it for the women to have authority? I think that uh, Lakota women are beginning to claim their own history. Yeah, and that is the ancestral land that I join you from and that we yes. broadcast from. Um, let's talk about some of that early contact and influence George Washington uh, refers to these as the petticoat chiefs because they are, you know, in conversation with their women. There's influences in Jefferson and, uh, you know, Ben Franklin. But I really want to talk about some of these women, uh, the Lucretia Mott, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, um, Matilda Jocelyn Gage, of course, who will have influence or who will be influenced by these women who will be in conversation with Haudenosaunee women. And that is what they need to see to imagine life in a different way. So before we get there, contrast the rights at the time of this contact between Haudenosaunee women yeah. and these European women who are living under, what is it, Blackstone's Code of Common Law, you know, who have this very different, how different are their lives? Tell us that, please. Well, we might begin actually with Abigail Adams. When she warns John, if particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we're determined to foment a rebellion. And I think what she's referring to is that England had recently adopted a very repressive common code, common law code. And it was the Blackstone Code, which said once women married, they were dead in the law. They ceased 
to exist legally. Now, what were the, and, and the founding fathers went ahead and boom, they threw off British rule and they adopted this repressive code. And each of the states adopted it and it made it illegal for women to vote. It made it illegal for women to hold on to their own possessions once they married. Everything you owned became your husband's. You lost your right to your body. Uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton said at one point, a woman needs a quit claim to her own body once she's married because husbands could rape their wives. They had the right to, they had the legal right to marital rape. Rape was defined as an act of unlawful sexual intercourse with someone other than the wife of the perpetrator. And it wasn't until the 1980s and 1990s that the second wave of feminism began to change those laws. And the marital rape laws don't even exist until then. So the 1980s, the 1990s, not the 1880s. Oh, no. <laughs> We're talking about 1980s and 90s, yeah. I remember in the California legislature, uh, I think it was 1980, the first marital rape law was introduced into the, the California legislature. And one of the senators stood up on the floor of the, the Senate in California and said, oh, come on, guys. If you can't rape your wife, who can't you rape? And everybody laughed explosion of laughter. This was 1980. There in most states today, because of the work of feminists, in most states and most territories today, it is illegal under most conditions for husbands to rape their wives. Not quite complete, but almost. Husbands have the right to beat their wives as long as they did not inflict permanent damage. And the, the religious uh, logic behind this, you know, was because of the sin of Eve, woman is to be under the authority of her husband. And that goes all the way through to St. Paul in the Bible. And so what does that mean to be under the authority? You have to obey your husband. You know, in the marriage ceremony, women said they would obey, men didn't. That was, it was, you were to obey your husband. That wasn't just a religious thing. That becomes translated from canon law into common law. So you had to obey your husband. You did not have the right to leave a marriage if, you, if your life was in danger. Because the idea prevailing in most denominations at that point was that marriage was not a civil union. That was a hard won battle to get marriage defined as, a, as an agreement between two people. Before then it was marriage was, um, was a covenant with God and could not be broken. Uh, so you, you had to stay if you left, your husband could declare you a runaway wife and you were required to live where he told you to live. And so if he contacted the authorities and said, my wife has run away, they could bring you back. And they did. You had no right to the children that you gave birth to. A husband could will away an unborn child on his deathbed, knowing he's dying. He says, this child, once it's born, will be given to so-and-so. And that child is ripped out in the mother's arms and given to its rightful owner. And the woman had no legal recourse. That was the position of women before the women's movement. There were some changes state by state before, but not until the women's movement really began to demand changes. And one of these reasons, one of the reasons, tell me about this, that when you mentioned Eve and you mentioned, uh, you know, uh, Christian scripture with Paul, the men feel that they are saving the souls of, I mean, this is their responsibility. Exactly. Uh, talk a little bit about that. The, the reason why this was taken so seriously by so many husbands and fathers was because they truly believed that we're not for them. Um, eternal damnation is what is at stake. Exactly. And that is, that's a logic that it takes a little bit, well, maybe not for other people. For me, I may just be dense, but it was hard <laughs> for me to understand this logic. But you've got it exactly, Laurie. Here's what it was. 
if you, if a woman is to obey her husband, a wife is to obey her husband, what happens if she dies in a state of disobedience? You know, she has the spiritual, religious responsibility to obey him. That's God's edict, you know, from, from the literal reading of the Bible. So she dies and she has disobeyed him. Where is she going to go? She is going someplace where it's pretty hot. <laughs> as hot as South Dakota can be on a summer day and hotter. <laughs> but, but whose fault is it? Now, this is where the logic gets tricky. Mm -hmm. Whose fault is it? It's not hers. It's her husband's because he did not enforce obedience. Mm -hmm. And so if you really love your wife, you're going to beat her into submission you're going to use whatever need, means are necessary to make, ensure that she obeys you, to ensure her salvation. So women who are living under that sort of culture, they, they're they hearing this, you know, in church, they're hearing it in the, from, from everyone legally um, in conversation. That's what they're reading. In order for them to get to the point where they say there is something else that is possible, they need to see that it is possible and they see it in the Haudenosaunee women and how there's an entirely different way of life. Tell me a little bit about some of what we know about the early suffragists connections with some of these clan mothers and leaders of the time. You know, I think I, I'm going to back up just a minute here, Lori, and tell you that if, if one of my students had come to me 40 years ago, I've been teaching for 50 years, I had my 50th year anniversary this year. Um, if somebody had come to me 40 years ago and said, you know, I think that there's some native influence on women's rights, you know, know what my response would have been? Nah, I don't think so. If if there was, somebody would have figured that out by now. Somebody would have. Well, <laughs> it took me a lot of figuring out to get to the point of this is real. And what I realized was that once I started talking about it and writing about it, was that Native women were saying, oh, that's great. We've always known that. <laughs> so, <laughs> took a white scholar to come along and, and make it real. Not, not, not. I'm only repeating what, you know, anyway. And, and some didn't, you know, because, because of the boarding school education, because mm -hmm. of the, the training. But, okay, what was the contact? Well, my question really that I began with was, how did Matilda Jocelyn Gage get such a transformational vision? Our own Matilda, all her kids ended up in South Dakota. My mother's good friend was Matilda Gage from Aberdeen. That's how I stumbled into all of this and fell in love with this dead woman in 1973 and really wanted to understand. She's talking about a transformed world. She's talking about the end of every existing institution the result of the regenerated world. Whoa, where did this come from? Her major work, Woman, Church, and State, she says, and it's online and searchable, you can also buy it through the Matilda Jocelyn Gage Foundation, but, but she says, never was justice more perfect, never was civilization higher. And you know what she's talking about? In Tell us, yeah. <laughs> So there's the, that's the starting point. So what did she see? And she writes about how women have authority for the land. This is in 1893, same book in which she exposes sex trafficking in the United States and exposes that Catholic priests are sexually violating children and women. 
1893. In this same book, Woman, Church, and State, she writes about how Haudenosaunee women, Iroquois is the name the French gave them, maybe more commonly recognized. Um, they, are ha they have responsibility for the land. They have the responsibility for determining whether there will be war. They control the economy through controlling the agriculture. They're the agriculturalists. The, the most sacred is life. And who creates life? Women and Mother Earth. Mother Earth sustains us, women create life. That's a turning upside down, you know, rather than the, 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 the father in the sky, this is the mother in the earth that is the mm -hmm. spiritual center. And so because women are the creators of life, the idea is they're the ones most sacred to bring forth life from the soil. And she writes about corn, beans, and squash, the ecologically perfect and nutritionally perfect food group that the women raised together and the abundance with which they raised it. And nobody went hungry. So she understood all of this and she wrote about the, the responsibilities of the clan mothers. She saw a world in balance and harmony. She saw it firsthand. She was invited to ceremony at the Onondaga Nation. She writes about the, the sacred ceremonies. And she says, you know, during the Middle Ages, it was the warrior that was most respected rather than the, the products. Products is not the right word. The relatives, <laughs> if you think we are all related, Matakoyasin, same belief with, with the uh, Haudenosaunee, that we are all in relationship with each other, all living things. And what we know now scientifically is that's all true. We're all stardust. We're all made from the same <laughs> thing, you know? So, so it's, um, um, it's a, a, a knowledge that I think because Matilda Jocelyn Gage, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott all had begun to really become critical of Christianity and its role in the oppression of women in Western Christian societies, that they were able to see beyond that sort of Christian exceptionalism that led to the boarding school experience, Christianize and civilize the Indians. They're heathens. We need to bring them to the true light. Um, they had gone past that. And so they were able to see a culture that was beyond anything that they could even imagine in their own. But here it is in reality. Elizabeth Cady Stan, who is called a heretic for calling for divorce if a woman's life is in danger or the marriage is loveless, she talks about divorce Haudenosaunee style. She says, the, the, um, the wife puts his belongings outside the longhouse. That's it. Who lives in that longhouse? Well, the clan mother, the, the mother, the father, the sisters and their husbands. The husbands come to live with the sisters. The unmarried brothers, the ones that aren't married yet, once they marry, they go live with their wives' clan. And why is that? Because children come through the mother, not the father. It's a matrilineal culture, not a patriarchal, patrilineal culture like ours. And so all of this makes sense in an integrated way. Elizabeth Cady Stanton talks about how if the chief misbehaves himself, if he doesn't behave the way he should, the clan mother cuts off his horns. That's the phrase she uses. She removes him from his office. She holds the horns, the symbol of, his, of the authority that she places on him. She's the eyes and the ears. He's the voice of the clan. And she instructs him. The petticoat government, when the Haudenosaunee came to do treaties with the colonists or the US government, the, their first question is, where are your women? We can't do a treaty. We're going to be talking about land and there's no women. 
women are in charge of land. What? You guys don't know anything? You know, what's going on here? We tend to universalize. So, so those are a couple with Gage. Gage ends up being given an honorary adoption into the Wolf Clan of the Mohawk Nation and a real name. The same year she's arrested for voting in her own nation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> She also, um, she supports treaty rights and sovereignty in her woman's rights newspaper. She writes about the superior position of Haudenosaunee women when she is president of the National Women's Suffrage Association, does a series of articles as president. So this knowledge is back and forth. Uh, those things that Elizabeth Cady Stanton said, that was at the... Uh, National Council of Women, a speech in 1891. Alice, and it wasn't just these women, Lucretia Mott, I'll give this example. Lucretia Mott spends a month with, and, and a good bit of that time is with the Seneca, one of the Haudenosaunee nations. And when she writes about her summer experience, she comes from Cataragus, the Seneca community, where she watches the women plan the spiritual ceremony, the straw, strawberry ceremony she's there for. She watches the women be an equal participant in the governmental decisions. And she then comes to visit her friends in the Seneca Falls area. And together they plan the first Seneca, the first local Women's Rights Convention in Seneca Falls in the summer of 1848. Now, when she writes about this, and in the anthology I did, The Women's Suffrage Movement for Penguin Classics, I looked and looked and looked to find her description of Seneca Falls. I found it in a letter she wrote to an anti-slavery paper, and she writes about her whole summer. She spends three paragraphs describing her experience with the, uh, with the Seneca, with the Haudenosaunee. One paragraph on the Seneca Falls Convention. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's, you know. <laughs> but, but you think about, okay, you've been to paradise. You come back and you meet with some of your friends. Possibly you might talk about that. Mm -hmm. As they're planning the Seneca Falls Convention, what do you think she's talking about? Right. And it goes and on and on. There's yeah. I want to ask you this about your own scholarship, though. As, as you said, you know, you've been teaching 50 years, and if someone had come and asked you this early in your academic career, you would have said, yeah, I don't think so. What so much in 2020 has been made of racism in yes. academia and, in, and in, in places where you aren't necessarily looking for it if you don't know to look. Yeah. But for black and brown people, it's, they're very aware that it was there. Yeah. Uh, so my question to you is, what was the role of racism in inhibiting some of the scholarship that you didn't even know what you were looking for. Like you maybe had overlooked it already 10 times. What can you say about that now from, from the perspective where you stand today? Yeah, it's, it's um, <laughs> I have to speak as a recovering racist. I read Woman, Church and State the first time in 1973. I read that book. I wrote every introduction to every way it was it was printed, and I never saw those words. Never was justice more perfect. Never was civilization higher. I didn't see those words for 15 years. And I didn't see those words. I realized once I kind of had a, <laughs> I call them my white girl timeouts. Um, until I really said, okay, you've got to look at why didn't you see that? It's in the first chapter of her major work. Those words are, there's no two ways to interpret those. Those words are pretty definitive. And she is clearly talking about the Haudenosaunee. Why didn't you see it? And my thought was, it was because underneath all the work that I'd done on, on racism. I had conducted numerous anti-racist workshops. I had really tried to examine my own racism. 
racism lays so deep. I'll speak about myself in me that I did not even recognize what I held was the idea that Native women wouldn't have anything to teach white women anyway. They were just beasts of burden. They walked 10 paces behind their husbands. That was the knowledge that was hidden deep underneath any other kind of knowledge. And it was a deeply embedded racism. What I do now is I proceed so slowly with any of my scholarship because it's recognizing the poison of racism that is endemic in the culture in which I live and that occupies a deep space in me. You know, white exceptionalism, the privilege that I live with every single second, most of which I'm not aware of as a white person. It's a constant, you know, recovering racist is the best that I can describe myself because it is one day at a time. It is, you know, oh, whoa, there's a little bit more I just realized and a little bit more I just realized. But I think when I can get past the shame and guilt, you know, those feelings and get to a point of, I'm a better person. I think each time I can, I can recognize my own racism and, and move to a better place. Um, and I, I want to ask you this along the same vein, as a white woman, you say in the movie, um, without a whisper, that hanging out with Louise Hearn, who is a, a clan mother, mm -hmm. um, just spending time with her and other women makes you feel like a new woman. Mm -hmm. Like there's you, just spending, just hanging out, I think you say, yep. you are influenced by the way in which they inhabit their authority, yes. inhabit their own bodies, but just the people that they are. I've had those experiences too in my life and I stand back and I'm like, what just happened? Like what's happening there where I am standing next to this woman and all of a sudden, I feel like I'm different as a human being. What can you tell me about that as a woman living a white experience um, to be with someone like Louise, to be in friendship and you know academic scholarship with her, but then also just step back and say, um, she's, that's an incredible thing that I have a hard time articulating. You know, I, 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 can talk about Louise, but you know, I'm going to be honest with you. What first comes to mind is Tilly Black Bear and my friendship with Tilly, the unexpected friendship with Tilly and a whole bunch of Lakota women um, that, that had a generous enough spirit to bring me into their lives. And that to me is the wonder. I mean, these are people who should see me as their enemy. You know, given the history, the legacy, um, they have no reason to befriend me. But they have a spiritual base, a spiritual foundation that is so much deeper than anything that I have culturally. And it's a generosity that allows them to see beyond and into a place of friendship. Tilly Blackbear transformed my life. Still a pretty sounding flute transformed my life. I could spend hours with you, Lori, naming the women who have transformed my life. And in ways that I don't even recognize, you know? Yeah. It's like we universalize our own world. And these are women who, I mean, standing with a group of Lakota women when a man comes along who needs to, to sort of be brought out of his sense of himself being a little bit bigger than he is and watching that humor of, of just bringing him to himself, not meanly, but kindly bringing him to himself. I mean, that is like worth 10,000 workshops on how to, you know, how to deal with, <laughs> with a sexist experience. It's, it's, I don't even know where to begin. Everything that I do, 
I, I teach differently. I approach knowledge differently. Every bit of scholarship, every bit of the way that I understand myself in the world uh, transformed. And in ways that people don't even recognize. Let me give you one little example, okay? Because just so that it's not so all over the map. One time I was with Tilly, Black Bear, and she called her newborn grandson, grandfather. And I said, Tilly, is there something I'm missing here? That guy looks pretty well to me. And, and she said, we're spiritual. And, and I, I hope I'm doing this correctly. This is the best I understand and remember. She said, we're spiritual beings on a physical journey. And those most sacred are those who are coming from the spirit world and those who are returning to the spirit world. And so they're closest together. I think she first started out with a little bit of Lakota humor that was like, well, both of them don't have teeth and, and need diapers. <laughs> Even if it's okay, and then the deeper. But what that gift has given me is a sense of growing old in a different way. I'm 78. I, in my Western thought, live horizontally or in vertical. You know, so it's like from birth to death is a straight line. If I think of myself, so I'm approaching an end. But if I think of myself with the gift of that thought from Tilly, I understand why I keep feeling younger. You know, as I grow older, mm -hmm. it's like a lot of the crap just disappears. <laughs> You get down to some more basic stuff. Yeah. And and so I feel younger and younger and younger as I grow older and older. And and it makes sense to me in a Lakota way. I don't have any understanding of it in, in a, a white Christian Western way. Yeah. So that's just one tiny example. But watching women who are, as you said, so self-empowered, not in any way of, of superiority, but, you know, and watching men just follow what a, a woman says. Louise says something, men are just doing it. There, there's not a sense of um, I, I, it, there, the subtle ways in which we as women incorporate and live in the, the non-native, non-indigenous world, live in... Um, a sense of our secondary status coming from generations of that. And to be with women who come from generations of, of empowerment and balance and harmony, not superiority, not living in a hierarchy, but living in a circle. It, it's just mind blowing. <laughs> so when we look at 2020, where we have elected the first female vice president of the United States. We have examples of authority and political power in the United States of America, such as Kamala Harris, Stacey Abrams, Governor Kristi Noem from South Dakota, Amy Coney Barrett in the US Supreme Court, vastly different ways of seeing authority and political influence, even though we would define all these women as women, we would see, we would talk about the first female governor of the state, the first female vice president. Um, that might be where their similarities end in a lot of ways from a political influence standpoint. From the Haudenosaunee perspective, um, what are the lessons of political authority and how to use it that you think might be relevant in 2020? Every person has a voice. When the clan mother nominates the chief, it's not a spur of the moment thing. She's watched these boys grow up. She's watched the boy who has stepped back and let others step forward and who sees the needs of people, who, who is thoughtful and considerate and not self-promoting. She's watched him play lacrosse. She's watched to see. You know, is he a team player? She's watched to see how he is with his with his grandmother, you know? 
does does he watch to see if she needs something? Does he bring her um, something to drink if he thinks she might be there? You know, that's who she watches. That's who she grooms. That's who she nominates. Then she goes to every, all the women, and that includes children. You know, is there any reason he should not represent us? He should not be our voice. What clan mothers have said to me is that there are three sort of general rules. He, he does have to have thick skin, seven, seven layers thick, I think they say, so that, that he, um, you know, he can stand the criticism that will come and take the courageous. He has to make all decisions for the seventh generation. The face is still in the earth is the way they describe the unborn. He must make decisions that, that he hears through the clan mother what the will of the people is because she's the eyes and the ears and if he goes against that if he does something for himself she gives him a warning if he a second time she tries to bring him back to the path if a second time he strays she tries to bring him back again and if a third time he does it she has the responsibility to remove him she alone has that. That's part of her, her task, her job, the balance of authority. And the, the sort of three things that he cannot have done. He cannot have committed a theft. He cannot ever have stolen anything. He cannot have uh, committed a murder. And if he's a warrior, he has to step down. And if he, and he cannot have abused a woman. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that being a, a rule for hmm. leadership? So, so the process of choosing a leader is, as I understand it, and I'm, again, I'm, I'm non-native. I'm not, I'm, I'm the opening act. Louise is the one who talks about what really goes on. She's the one to listen to tomorrow night. Um, so, or, Tuesday, huh? Mm -hmm. Whatever this airs. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, but but I think that the 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 bottom line, as I one woman explained to me, is that we look for character. We know that people are going to make mistakes, but we look for somebody's character. How careful are they of other people? How thoughtful are they in making their decisions? How much are they listening to the will of the people? You know, those, those kinds of, of qualities. Is this an arrogant person? Nah, never be a chief. Um, so I think that, that leads to different decisions about who will be a leader. And how they will lead. Yeah. And how they will lead. 